So the next part is our next C is cash flow. Um, finances is obviously for us business is the biggest part, the biggest risk in this time. Um, so cash flow is where you need to be really on top of it. Uh, and the key here is um, making sure there's enough money in the bank to last this next period of time. Number one your cash reserves, your current cash reserves. We spoke about it a bit earlier when you in Clarify, talking, looking at what you've currently got. And the next step after just looking at what you've got is just working out how are you gonna preserve that? Um, so if it's in the bank already, how are you gonna look after and make sure that you're not uh, running through it in, in any way, shape or form so that you can preserve the current cash reserves? Um, we'll talk about how we can do that in a bit. Uh, but that's step number one, preserving your current cash reserves. Step number two, is then maximizing your cash cushion, so adding extra cash reserves wherever possible. So this is talking about increasing um, your credit lines if possible, uh, drawing down uh, forms of credit if you can. Uh, on a very simple level, we for example have drawn down six and a half grand on a credit card, just on a on a 1.9% um, for an 18 month uh, interest free credit card, just to have an extra cushion uh, that we can draw upon if necessary. For 1.9% on that, it's nothing to be able to have that extra security in place. So that's just one tiny thing you could do if, if that type of thing is available to you. Mm. So just look at what access to credit you currently have and just, you know, we're, we're making the most of it because I'd rather pay a bit of extra interest, have that cash in the bank because you can pretty much weather storms when you have that cash available. Yeah. And then making decisions in terms of if you're having to do anything at the moment uh, that you, you're new, any setting up any new kind of stuff, uh, choosing to spread payments where you mm. might not normally, where you might normally say, do you know what, I'll um, I pay for things up front to save the money. Yeah, we, Dave did a new insurance policy today <laughs> and he looked at me and he went, do you want to spread this over 12 months or do you want to pay up front? Cause, well, our plan is ultimately to bring all of our insurance payments, pay them up front because you get them cheaper. And we looked at each other and we went, no, <laughs> not in this time. This is not the time to pay up front. We will pay the 7.5% interest on that uh, insurance policy and to spread it out over those 10 months because access to more cash in the bank right now is what we are aiming for. Yeah. Um, so the next thing you need to be really getting on top of as soon as possible uh, is getting line of sight on your cash flow forecast because all the information in the world is no use unless you can actually utilize it in some sort of forecasting capacity. So we need to get some good cash flow forecasting going. If you haven't got anything in place at the moment, just get something for now, something very simple and effective that, that deals with the current and the next few months. Um, so just getting hold of your immediate P&L and then just forecasting forwards three months is all you need to do at the moment. And that can be done fairly quickly, uh, especially if you're on some sort of cloud-based software like Xero or, or or, um, QuickBooks. Uh, so getting that cash flow forecast in place so you can start bringing all that info from our, our Clarify section uh, and, and bring that forward into, into this point. So if you don't currently have it set up to be able to get a PL easily, you might just have to create something a bit rough and ready. Go through your bank accounts for the last couple of months and just see what expenses are normally coming out and just pull something together. But also take this as a moment to say, hey, I'm going to have some more time coming up. Let's actually sort this out and get a proper system set up for it because this is the time that you need access to that data. So delaying non essential payments is the next part of this so what have you maybe planned to be outlaying on that perhaps you don't really need to like are you thinking about upgrading to a new software that's going to cost you some cash or are you thinking about uh, what was the other example that oh like maybe doing a, a whole piece of rebranding for your business or something like this what do you really do you really need that? Is it essential to the operation of the business or, or could we just push that back? And hey, we might not be talking about a big pushback here. Even just three, four weeks might be all you need just to wait for some certainties to start to come back around a bit to be able to have the confidence again. But if you don't need to spend it right now, uh, don't don't spend it. Uh, we're also looking at maintenance. So anything except essential maintenance right now, we are delaying. And again, it's not going to be well, we hope it's not going to be for a long time, but we're just looking at reviewing non-essential maintenance items two to three weeks down the line. Another area this could be is new hires. Are you thinking about hiring someone new? We've got a couple of new hires in the process, not, not at the point of offering jobs yet, but we're just slowing down that process. So I, it's, not, it's not that it's not going to happen. It's just that I don't want to increase our monthly overheads right now until we have got more certainty about how long this is going to go ahead for and uh, we've got a great team and everyone can pull together and we might have to work a little bit harder in the short term but hey 
what else have you got to do? The cinema's closed. <laughs> <laughs> the next part of this, there are going to be some payments that are essential that you cannot do anything about um, that are going to need to remain there. So what with these payments, you want to have a look at what could you do to reduce how much those are. So um, we were thinking earlier about other business models apart from our own and we had some questions about it. So like rent to rent service accommodation, for example, you have got a monthly rental payment that you need to make to the landlord. Um, but that, that's a pretty essential payment. If you don't pay that, you're going to get taken to court. Um, so you want to pay it. But actually, if it's in the landlord's interest for you to remain solvent through this time. So go and have that conversation. See if you can renegotiate what that rent looks like in the short term um, just to help you get through this. Um, and we'll talk about deferment rather than just not paying in a moment. But just how can you renegotiate what's currently going out right now? Um, look at your staff costs. It's probably one if you've got a team, it's probably one of your biggest monthly outgoings aside from perhaps mortgages. So could you look at reducing um, your those essential costs that are going out every single month? Yeah, so in terms of mortgage holidays, really all the work you're going to do on cash flow forecasting, on assessing your tenant, your risk, how much percentage of rent is not going to come in, these elements, this is the info you're going to use to decide whether or not you need a mortgage holiday. Or, I mean, if banks, if banks are going to be talking about mortgage holidays, they might be open to other things like um, reducing your rates for a little bit, reducing your interest rates for a little bit. It might be other options that are much less severe than a full mortgage holiday. Um, I think everyone needs to be a bit careful around the banks and mortgages. Um, just a reminder that back in the last recession in 2008, there were mortgage holidays that were offered and it was taken up by people and it was meant to be on a no um, risk black to mark. credit, no yeah. black mark basis. And shockingly, out the back end, there were black marks put against credit files. So even though it can be promised, it doesn't mean that necessarily it comes out the end, comes out the wash exactly as expected. So it's not just a thing to phone up and say, woohoo, free time. Um, <laughs> Just take it with, with a pinch of salt, what's said, just to be careful. And also, I think going back to our very first point about analysing your current portfolio situation, what percentage of rent is actually at risk? Because if you've got this kind of information, this data to have these discussions around, you're going to come across a lot better than some joker who's just like, can I have three months off, please? Mm. Um, and if your tenants are still paying, mate, you don't need a mortgage holiday, otherwise your business doesn't work. So what... What do you actually need? And it might even be that you don't actually need a mortgage holiday. You've actually got just a, a proportion of your rents that aren't actually being paid. So maybe just a reduction of 20 or 30 percent um, of your mortgage uh, costs each month might make the difference. I think that discussion, it comes across a lot more professional <laughs> than just... Um, taking it when you don't actually really need it yet. and in the end i think i'm hoping everyone everyone here everyone on this facebook live is someone who's wanting to build their businesses fairly large and is wanting to build a great relationship with their bank so just remember that the more robust you can come across to your bank the, the less you struggle in times of turmoil like this the better you're going to seem to them so the better in the future they can look back on you and say oh yeah during that time you didn't have a problem. Oh, great. We like you. You're the type of person we want to lend to. So just remember that relationship when you're making decisions about mortgage holidays and whether you're going to try and push for them or not. Yeah. And I'm, that's not to say that we won't go and ask for it if we need to ask for it. But our point is it should be part of a wider package of measures that you're taking and not just as a first step to go running to the bank. So if you are in the serviced accommodation industry, I think this is probably the, mo the business model that's been most affected so far by coronavirus, you might need to start thinking about reviewing how your business model actually is, is operating in the short term. Um, so with service accommodation, depending on your area, you might be able to still ride it out. I'm pretty sure holidays are going to come to an end, but if you have maybe contractors still coming and those contractors, their businesses are ongoing, you might still be able to get bookings, but you might want to be quite aggressive with the, the rates and what you're offering, just because it'd be better to have something covering some costs than it just sitting there empty. But I would still say doing that alongside a package of um, renegotiating with the landlord too. Um, and, and if it was asked if I was running service accommodation, I'd be considering a short term strategy switch to um, to single lets. Um, if, you know, if you're in an area where there are people with jobs <laughs> mm, yeah people are still looking for accommodation people are out there trying mm. to get accommodation and if it covers you for you know it might mean as you know six months of, of buy to let you might have to do a six you know if someone's open for a six month contract you've got at least rent covered for six months and you might not make a lot of profit or as much profit as planned but at least you're safe that's the mm. key here is to, to just pivot to be 
uh, safe in the short term and then go back to your original plans once once we've gotten past the initial turmoil and crisis. And thinking about um, being a landlord in these times, actually, compared to other industries, I think we're very lucky because, yes, we are going to have short term cash flow implications that we've got to manage, but we do still have people living in our properties. And if we help them manage their cash accordingly, it's more you are going to have some people that are going to not pay you back the arrears. But if you manage it well, it should be more of a case of deferment of rent rather than non-receivable of rent, if that mm. is the word to so use. So I think with all of this, I think across the board, when you're talking about the, the monies that you're trying to kind of uh, reduce and the money that you're with your tenants, you're trying to kind of make plans, always work on a deferment basis, always trying to work not just how what money you're not paying now how, when is it going to be paid back and over what period of time that should be in the initial discussions because we're not talking about getting free accommodation or getting money off or getting free money somehow we're talking about just weathering a tough period and um, how is the repayment plan going to be worked out the back end so that it works for everyone and if you can have those conversations straight away you're in a really realistic situation where we're all going to help work work together and i think for us with our tenants that is obviously our first port of call is like we want to help them as much as possible and we want to help them manage their money during this time and just remember as a, as a as a business owner someone who runs their own business you are going to be much better at managing your finances than the most of the majority of your tenants are so be aware that these people may be less uh, financially savvy than you may, may be less financially uh, good at, at managing their, their their cash than you so helping them to do that and getting involved a little bit where where you can to to help them manage money is, is essential to making sure that out the back end you're actually going to regain those arrears, as it were, not deferment of rent. You're going to actually be able to get them back over a period of time uh, with payment plans that are actually suitable for the tenants. I would suggest that you geek out on the details of new legislation as it comes in. Uh, don't just read the news, like go to like HMRC website. There's quite often stuff on there um, to, to know what like what. What, what does someone have to do if they are out of work? Uh, how do you get the statutory sick pay? Um, how do you get uh, ESA? Um, and how do you, what's the next step for getting those? Because they've the government have relaxed it so that you can get access to the benefit systems quicker. But what does that actually mean for someone? And it could be someone who's needing to go to the benefit system who's never actually been there before. So help them to do that. So we've just created a crib sheet to send out to tenants when they are get, starting to get into difficulty just to direct them because we, we can we can help we can work with them to do that if they've not had to do it before so put your brain space on on geeking out on those details i think one of the things also we've done with with, with tenants is uh when we are opening that line of communication to talk about deferment of rent it's not just an upfront all right yeah two months that'll be fine let's let's just work on two months mm. we this situation is evolving we don't know where we're going to be in two weeks time or even one week time so we're working at the moment on a two-week review basis so we're, we're saying this is what we'll do for the next two weeks let's have a chat again then see what your situation is and we'll decide then whether we want to roll forward for another two weeks uh, so just being really kind of a bit short term with how you talk to them so you're always on top of the scenario that's as it unfolds mm -hmm.